Good evening. I'm Steve Dinkin, President of the National Conflict Resolution Center. Welcome to the second in our A Path Forward National Dialogue series on the timely and urgent topic of overcoming polarization in our country and healing the political divide. When I joined the organization in 2003, I never imagined the significance that our name would take on. The work we began nearly 40 years ago has never been more relevant or necessary. Having worked in 12 countries, four continents, and six cabinet-level departments, NCRC impacts over 30,000 lives annually through conflict resolution services and communication trainings. Through our efforts, we are creating innovative solutions to address some of the most challenging issues of our time. Mass incarceration, the Me Too movement, freedom of expression on college campuses, and finally, the topic of this evening, overcoming hate, intolerance, and incivility throughout society. The pursuit of this last issue came into focus in 2019, when our hometown of San Diego endured two hate crimes in a month's time, attack on a mosque and a murder at a synagogue. We brought people together throughout the city and throughout the county to engage in dialogue, sensing an eagerness to begin the healing process and turn tragedy into positive change. In essence, to find a path forward. As our community and the country struggle with the pervasive issue of racial injustice in the aftermath of the George Floyd tragedy, in August, NCRC hosted our very first national dialogue, a conversation on race with authors Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo that drew more than 8,000 participants from around the globe. Perhaps you are one of them. Tonight, we will look at hatred, intolerance, and incivility from another angle, political polarization. That's why we invited Arthur Brooks to join the conversation. We couldn't think of a better person than someone who wrote a book called Love Your Enemies, Actually, the full title is Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. Arthur believes that our country has a contempt habit that's warping political discourse. You'll hear some suggestions tonight for breaking this habit of bridging the political divide. Along with his work as an author and speaker, Arthur Brooks is a professor of the practice of public leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School and before joining the Harvard faculty in July of 2019, Arthur served for 10 years as president of the Washington, D.C.-based American Enterprise Institute, one of the world's leading think tanks. And while you won't get a chance to hear his musical stylings this evening, he is also an accomplished French hornist. And some of you may not know, but Arthur was NCRC's 2020 National Peacemaker recipient. We're so sorry that we had to cancel our gala due to the COVID-19, but we are so grateful that we get to hear from him this evening. Following tonight's discussion, you will have an opportunity to sign up and participate in a series of no-cost national dialogues and conflict resolution trainings and receive a communication toolkit so that you can also begin the journey along a path forward. I hope you enjoy this evening's conversation. Please welcome Arthur Brooks. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. I am so deeply honored to be the 2020 National Peacemaker Award winner. The National Conflict Resolution Center has done amazing work. I've been an admirer for a long time. So have you, if you're tuning in. I imagine that most of you know a lot about the NCRC's work. And if you're a supporter, Congratulations on your wisdom in doing so, but also thank you on behalf of me as an American. We have so much bitterness, so much polarization, indeed so much contempt in our society today that the mission of the organization is more important than ever. We have to redouble our efforts. We have to band together. And that's what I wanna talk about now. It's no surprise to anybody that, that we see lots and lots of data about the conflict that's roiling our society, not just in terms of politics, but ideologically, socially, culturally, all different sorts of ways. I saw some data that really, really alarmed me not too long ago, that one in six Americans has stopped talking to a close friend or family member 
since 2016 because of politics. 44% of Americans are estranged from at least one family member. <laughs> Most of that is because of politics today, because of ideological differences. That, I'm, I, I have to say straight out, is not right. That's an error. That's lowering our quality of life. Too much conflict is tearing us apart and making us less happy. So here's my question tonight. What can I do to make things better? I mean, I can talk about platitudes about the president of the United States and public policies, and, and it wouldn't be better if all the leaders did this or did that. But, but really, we all know that change starts with me and you. Change starts with the individual. And if we want to be empowered in this great country, we have to think and have strategies for what each one of us can do to lower the temperature, to lower the level of conflict, to live out the NCRC's incredible mission in our day-to-day -day lives. So that's what I want to talk about now. Now, I want to start by, by remembering with you when we all first started seeing the path that we were on that was really dangerous with the augmentation of conflict in our society. Um, I remember it was about 2014. It was more than, uh, more or less like 2014. I remember exactly when it was. It was in February of 2014 when I read a, a, an academic article. It's, you know, it's what I do for a living. I'm an academic. And I was reading about something called motive attribution asymmetry. Now, fancy words. It's what we academics do. You know, you take simple concepts, you put on fancy words, and you get tenure. Anyway, motive attribution asymmetry, what is it? It's the phenomenon in a conflict situation in which both sides believe that they are motivated by love, but the other side is motivated by hatred. And when you think about it, that's impossible. That's an error on one side or both, because you can't have two parties to a conflict in which both sides are simultaneously motivated by love and hatred. One side is wrong, usually both. Now, why is this important, this motive attribution asymmetry? Because it explains most of the intractable conflicts around the world and between people. You see a lot of it in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and in the, in the wake of the Rwandan genocide in the Balkans. You also see it among couples when couples are, are bitterly battling each other and on their way to divorce court, they tend to say, I love, but he hates. And he says, I love and she hates. There's an error in there. And you know that is actually the good news. When you see a conflict situation based on a, a cognitive or, or a psychological error and you can correct it, there's a way to get less conflict. So there's bad news insofar as that we see this. There's good news in that we can actually solve this problem. Now, when I was reading this article in February, the reason in February 2014, the reason it really caught my interest is because of the ending part where the where the where the authors, who were three psychologists at Northwestern University, they said and they noticed based on the data that the level of motive attribution asymmetry in politics in America in 2014 was as high as it was in the Palestinian Israeli conflict. That really caught my eye because I thought, wow. I mean, I know that Democrats and Republicans have a hard time getting along, but for Pete's sake, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, this is what we're dealing with? And sure enough, that was the freight train that was coming at us. I just happened to see it a little bit early because of these bellwether data. A month after that, I saw it firsthand. See, it was on my mind. The concept was on my mind, and I was doing what I always do. I travel around. I give speeches. It's really great. I mean, now I kind of go up to my Zoom studio and give speeches, but it's still wonderful to talk to interesting people about ideas. And, and I, was, I had this mode of attribution asymmetry on my mind when I was in New Hampshire one fateful day. I was giving a speech for a group of 600 conservative activists. Now, I didn't only talk to conservative groups at that time or any time. I talked to everybody. I don't really care what people think about politically. I want to share ideas. That's what excites me. So sometimes I talk to very progressive audiences, sometimes very conservative, sometimes right in the middle of the road or non-ideological like NCRC. Okay. So in this case, it was 600 really fired up conservative activists. And I got there a little bit early and I was one of 15 speakers. Now I noticed right off the bat that there was something weird about this event because I was the only speaker not running for president. So I thought, this is a mistake. And then I thought, actually, there aren't any mistakes. There's only opportunities. So what's my opportunity? And the answer is, I can say anything I want. Why? Because I don't need any votes. I don't have to run for anything. 
I don't have to win anything. So I got out there, and I, I, I said, made a little plan for what I was going to say to this audience. Because the people before me, the speakers before me, they were throwing raw stakes out into the audience. They were saying, you're right. And the other side, they're stupid and evil for all intents and purposes. I thought to myself, hmm, what can I say that's going to lower the temperature? So in the middle of my speech, as I was talking to the audience, I stopped and I said, you know, you've been getting really fired up from all these politicians. You've been ready for the conflict in America. But I want you to think for a minute about the people who are not here. They're not here because they wouldn't be comfortable with what we're talking about. They're political progressives. And I want you to remember something. They're not stupid and they're not evil. They're simply Americans who disagree with you. And if you want to persuade them, which should be your goal, you can only do it one way. And that's with love. <laughs> it was not an applause line, but there was applause, not for me. It was for a lady who, as soon as I said that, she yelled out, actually, they are stupid and evil. Now, she wasn't trying to repudiate me. It was a joke. It was kind of a festive atmosphere. <laughs> but it made me think about something. And this was a clear moment for me as a social scientist, but no, as a person. As soon as that lady said that about those people being stupid and evil, my mind went to Seattle. Why? Because it's my hometown. That's where I was brought up. Now, anybody who doesn't know, Seattle, Washington on the West Coast of the United States is probably the politically most progressive place in the world. And I come from a progressive family. Now, my own views are way more centrist and and and, you know, I have a lot of views that aren't in line with what my family thinks, but I'm the oddball. I'm the odd man out. Let me tell you something about my family. They're not stupid. They're not evil. When that lady said that in that audience in New Hampshire, she was talking about my mom. And I took it personally. That was important for clarifying my thinking about the, the coming storm of conflict. Why? Because, you know, it reminded me of something that my father taught me when I was young, which is that the, the mark of moral courage is not standing up to the people with whom you disagree. You know, anybody can do that. It's a good thing to do. That's fine. But that's not moral courage. Moral courage is standing up to the people with whom you agree on behalf of those with whom you disagree. That's a hard thing to do. That costs your friends. But every single one of you watching this right now, you know that it's the right thing to do if you want a society in which we can appreciate each other, in which we can be civil to each other, in which we can treat each other with respect. No, with love. That's what we have to do. Now, that set me on an agenda, actually, an agenda that led me to write a book called Love Your Enemies, <laughs> an ancient concept yet so hard. How can we do that? Well, let's first look a little bit at the genesis of this mode of attribution problem, this, 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 this conflict. Well, where does it come from? Some people will say, we're too angry. We're too angry as a country. And it's true. You turn on cable television and people are yelling at each other. It's pretty angry stuff. But anger, turns out, is not the problem. Anger, according to psychologists, is, believe it or not, uncorrelated with divorce. It's great news. Great news for me. I'm married to a Spaniard for 30 years, and that lack of correlation between anger and divorce is the secret to my happy marriage, I, I dare say. Now, it's something else, actually. It's something else. You see, anger is a negative emotion, but it says, I care, and I want you to think or act differently. What's going on is you take that negative emotion, anger, and you mix in another negative emotion, negative primary emotion processed deep in the brain, in the limbic system of the brain called disgust, which is the way that we, we deal with pathogens. When you take disgust and you mix it with anger, it's a complex emotion that philosophers call contempt. Contempt, according to the great philosopher from the 19th century, Arthur Schopenhauer, is the conviction of the utter worthlessness of another person. When you express contempt for somebody, you're saying, you're worthless. What you said is worthless. That is the perfect way to make an enemy. And when people treat each other with mutual contempt, especially because of politics, that's when you get motive attribution asymmetry. That's how you get where we are today. Hmm. 
Now, it's funny how how well this is understood in the in the in the literature and in the world of marital reconciliation, believe it or not. This is a good model for what we're trying to do because America these days is kind of like a a big couple on the rocks where we don't understand each other even though we should. We have a lot of history together, yet we're being ripped apart. And so to, to, for, for my own edification, as I was doing research on this subject, I went to the world's greatest expert on marital reconciliation, Dr. John Gottman, who runs the Gottman Marriage Laboratory with his wife, Julie Gottman, in Seattle, Washington. He is the uh, a professor of psychology at the University of Washington. And, and nobody, as far as I know, has brought more couples back together again that were on the brink of divorce. John Gottman has taken thousands of couples that could have gotten divorced and he's repaired their relationship. He told me that he can bring a couple into the laboratory and watch them talk about something that they're disputing just for an hour, just watch their conversation and know, knowing nothing else about them, he can predict with more than 95% accuracy if that couple will be divorced within three years. Huh. You wanna know what he's gonna look for, right? So you won't do it in your marriage if you're married? He's looking for eye rolling. <laughs> He's looking for derision and sarcasm. Why? Because those are the signs of contempt. That's not saying, I think you're worthless. It's more powerful than that. It's an exhibition of your true feeling acting in such a way that they can perceive that you see that they're worthless. And that's hugely harmful. It's an expression of hate. Imagine expressing hatred through contempt toward the person that, who deserves your love. Well, well, guess what? I mean, I realize we're not technically married to each other in America, <laughs> Democrats and Republicans, but we're all part of this society. We're all part of this great country. We deserve the affection, the esteem, the respect of our fellow citizens. And we, when we don't get it, when instead people treat us with contempt, hmm, well, that turns into what we see today, doesn't it? We have to stop eye rolling. We have to stop dismissing each other. We have to stop acting sarcastically. We have to stop expressing contempt. When I say we, by the way, I mean me. When I was doing research on this, I went back and looked at my YouTube clips and there's a million of them because I do television. And, and I, I, I saw, I found a clip of myself debating some economic policy with this woman on CNN or CNBC or something. And uh, she made what I considered to be a, a particularly ill-considered point and I rolled my eyes. And I guarantee you, she didn't go home that night and say to her family, I was, I was debating this economist named Arthur Brooks on television and he was making some very valid points. No, 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 I guarantee you she went home and said, that guy, Arthur Brooks, he's a jerk. And she wasn't wrong. I did the wrong thing. And the result of that was I made an enemy <laughs> and I didn't need to. I was simply talking about a difference of opinion. I was exploring differences in public policy. I was doing what we need to do in a free society in which the competition of ideas makes iron sharpen iron. Our democracy depends on a competition of ideas. We need to disagree. But when we can't disagree without hating each other, we become weak as a society. It's because of this contempt. So why do we do it? John Gottman finds in his couples that, that there's a habit of expressing each other in this way, that the contempt creeps into a marriage because they just don't know how to talk to each other anymore. And they get into these habitual patterns. Well, the same thing is true with all of us. And this comes from a, a very ancient part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It's part of the limbic system. It was evolved more than a million years ago. It governs your habit formation and your and your habit, habitual behaviors. So if you're a smoker, you can't willpower your way to stop smoking. You'll say, I won't smoke, I won't. You will. You have to reprogram this ancient part of your brain. And the way that you do that is by substituting something new for the stimulus that you were getting beforehand. You feel the urge to smoke and you do something else. You drink. <laughs> so when, when, when contempt, is a habit of communication that we have, which it is, we need to substitute something for the urge to roll our eyes, to speak with sarcasm toward our fellow men and women every time we have that urge. We have to do something else. We have to put in a new behavior. What should we do? Well, I have an answer to that. Before that, though, let me answer a particular question I often get. 
I hear this all the time. And look, I live on a college campus. I teach at a big university and, and, and college campuses are roiling with contempt. I mean, the cancel culture is exhausting where if you say something that I don't like, I'm gonna cancel you, try to get you fired, hurt your career, have you banished, <laughs> right? It's so unhealthy. And what I'll hear a lot when I talk about this, that we have to get rid of contempt in our societies and people will say, what about the people who deserve contempt? The people whose, whose views are so odious or so hateful or so obnoxious that I have contempt for their views and I have contempt for them. Why shouldn't I have that contempt? My answer? <laughs> My answer comes from the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. Love has within it a redemptive power, said Dr. King. And there is a power that eventually transforms individuals. If you hate your enemies, he says, you have no way to redeem and transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. What is this saying? What do you want? If, if somebody disagrees with you and you have contempt for that person, what do you want? Do you want to banish them and kick them out of the United States? Do you want to put them in jail? Do you want to physically harm them? No, you're not a terrible person. You don't want those things. You want to change their thinking. Well, how's your contempt working for that goal? How well is your hate working for making people think differently? How many people have ever been insulted into agreement? Approximately zero. Contempt works against your goals. It's hugely impractical. <laughs> and I dare say it's also immoral. Ask yourself this question. How many of you love somebody with whom you disagree politically? I'm gonna, I can't see you, but I'm gonna assume every hand and every heart is responding to that. 100%, I bet you all do. When somebody on your side has contempt for people on the other side, they're expressing contempt and hatred for somebody that you love. Like my mom on that day in New Hampshire. And that's a problem. So how are we gonna fix this? We need to find the thing that we put in place of our contempt when we feel that contempt. I asked the Dalai Lama that question. He's been my teacher and my collaborator and friend for the past seven years. The great privilege of my professional life is working with his holiness. And I asked him, when I feel contempt, your holiness, what should I do? And he said, show warm heartedness. And I thought, yeah, I can't really hang my hat on that. You know, you got something better. But then I thought about it. His Holiness the Dalai Lama was exiled from Tibet, his native Tibet, when it was rolled through by the Chinese army in 1959. And ever since then, he's lived in, in exile, <laughs> exile and poverty. And, you know, and this has happened throughout history, you know, in the history of conflict where the powerful suppress the weak. It's happened over and over and over again. When that happened, he was known to no one. And over that period, he's become the most respected, beloved religious leader in the world. How? With contempt? No, with warm heartedness. He lives this. He is an exemplar of this. He reminded me that, that if he can do it, anybody can do it. And it's so true, isn't it? So how are you gonna do it? Let me give you a, a couple of ideas on how it can start warm heartedness and no, love for your enemies. It can start with you. Number one. My first piece of advice is, is not that we should agree. People are always like, you know, if you have conflict, you got to find some way to, to agree. Well, ask the professionals of the National Conflict Resolution Center. They won't tell you that to mediate a dispute, you have to get to people to say, yes, we all agree on 100% of everything right now. No, no. You have to find some way to coexist with disagreement. That's how grown up people act. That's how civilized people act. Iron does sharpen iron. We don't need to agree. No, we must not agree on things. So I'm not asking for less disagreement. I'm adding, asking for better disagreement. How do we do that? Here's the first positive piece of advice. Turn off the outrage industrial complex. 93% of Americans, according to the best data available, hate how divided we become as a country. They hate the conflict. They hate it. That's all of you and it's me. That means 7% don't hate the conflict. Why not? Because they depend for their political fate on it or the money that flows into their media pockets from it 
or because they want the Facebook followers or they, they want, they, they're profiting in some way. When you hate, someone's profiting and it's not you. So turn it off. You have the power, you have the market power. And when I say turn it off, select the five outrage machines that are firing you up. And that doesn't mean turning off the people you disagree with because they're not on anyway. It means finding the columnist that scratches your itch, that, that, that serves your id, that says the things that are deep in your soul that you would be ashamed to say. Turn them off. Turn off the cable network that you, just, that you agree with. Get rid of the Facebook uh, feeds that are actually giving you stories that make you angry and make you hate the people around you. Turn it off. That's piece of advice number one. Piece of advice number two is go looking for contempt and running toward it with love. This is your, this is your big opportunity and mine. You know, if you want to transform a society, if you want to create more happiness, we all want to do that, right? You got to go looking for the conflict. Now, if I were telling you about most pathogens and, and, you know, let's think about the coronavirus. If one of your friends has the coronavirus, don't run toward it. You know, don't let your friend cough in your face. That's foolish. But contempt is different because our, 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 our opportunity for moral transcendence comes from confronting it, confronting it with love to neutralize it. You know, this is not the work of an epidemiologist. This is the work of a missionary. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I've known a lot of missionaries in my life. Probably you have too, whether you're religious or not. And there's a funny thing about missionaries, isn't it? They get rejection all the time. And yet they're so joyful. Right? You, know, you know the words that nobody's ever stated in life? Oh, great. There's missionaries on the porch. It's never been said. Right? And yet, they're, it's like, no, pretend we're not home. <laughs> and yet, they're filled with ebullience. They're filled with love and joy. Why is it? Because they believe they have the truth. So this is the point that I want to leave you with. This is what I want to charge you with. This is what I want to, this is what I want to share with you, and I want you to share with other people. It's a sign I actually saw along these lines in, a, in, a, in like a, a religious retreat center. I was doing something in a religious retreat center a couple of years ago. And I saw a sign over the door, not when you're coming in, but when you're going out to the parking lot, right? To the people who are in the religious retreat center when they're leaving. You know what the sign said? You are now entering mission territory. I thought to myself, that's not just religious advice. That's advice on creating a better life for more people with, with, with less conflict. And so if you agree with me and you want to make things better and you want it to start with you, if you want to neutralize contempt with love and you're ready and you're fired up, then as soon as you finish watching this broadcast, the one thing I want you to have on your mind, the one thing I want you to remember is that you are now entering mission territory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, for that most insightful and provocative discussion and presentation. I, it brought so many questions to my mind. So I'm just going to ask you to uh, take a quick seat and maybe we'll spend 20 minutes and let me ask a couple questions. Uh, That's great. Thank you, Steve. What a wonderful opportunity. I mean, I've, I've been so looking forward to this. You know, I've, been, I've been thinking about the fact that we are really in such unprecedented times. You know, we're in the aftermath of the elections. There was just the storming of the Capitol. And there's so much polarization and contempt in present day society. W when did that really start? I mean, why are we in this situation today? Has that always been like this? Well, there's always been a lot of conflict and there's always been a lot of ideological bitterness. That There's nothing, I mean, we have a tendency to say it's never been this bad before. And I understand it because it is pretty bad right now. But if you look at the 19th century, pretty much the whole 19th century was had more, more political conflict and ideological uh, polarization than what we see today. I mean, of course, culminating with a civil war. And we're, we're nowhere near that. Thank God we're not anything anywhere near that level of polarization, but it is bad compared to what it's been for most of the 20th century. And that's what's really alarming. The fact that it's not getting better, it tends to be getting worse. And so I think it's fair to say that there is cause for the consternation and discomfort that we feel. And there is a very urgent call for the good of the nation for us to work together to resolve many of these conflicts and to, to be able to coexist in a more productive, I dare say, loving way. 
So in, in, in present day society, we right now are so divided as a nation. I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we have the urban and the rural population. We have the wealthy and the poor. It's really the shrinking of the middle class. And we also have the Democrats and the Republicans. So how do we really bridge this divide with all of this division? To begin with, we need leaders that are modeling that bridging, which is really important. And, and that's one of the reasons that I gave the talk that I gave this evening, because the people who are watching us are, they all have leadership in their capacities. All of us do, frankly. I mean, we all lead groups of people or families, or you know, we have leadership positions in our communities. And people who are involved in the NCRC, they care about you know, groups, which means that kind of defines them as leaders. So to the extent that we, that we remember that, that people mimic leaders, we as leaders have a responsibility to be coming together. And, and again, this, what does this mean? See, we have this very fundamentally flawed leadership model in our politics today, which always happens in periods of populism and polarization. There's a strong belief on both right and left, Democrats and Republicans, that if I don't get 100% of what I want, I've failed. And so I have to completely vanquish you. I have to, you know, have to, you know, throw, have to uh, uh, trample you underfoot. That is insanity. You know, it, it, in business, people will say, I want the other partner to the transaction to be getting enough that he comes back and we have another transaction. And the same thing is true with any mediation. You don't want to walk away with 100% of the gains because you, you, what you're effectively doing is you're, you're beating the other person, which leads to bitterness. There's Dale Carnegie, the great, you know, a writer of self-improvement from the 1930s. He used to have this little poem to remind himself of this concept. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You want mediation to fail? Pick one winner and one loser. <laughs> That's the wrong way to, I mean, I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle by telling you about how mediation works. But look, to, to, to resolve conflict, we have to get away from this win-loss mentality. We have to get toward the idea that, that people can peacefully coexist and never agree. I mean, look, my wife and I will never agree on certain issues. We'll never agree on certain things about raising our children. And we're in love until death do us part. If we can do it, people can do it. And that's the way we need to start thinking again. Well, I'll have to use that technique with my wife, but <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking about values though. I mean, it's, it's one thing to uh, not necessarily have 100% agreement on certain issues, but when we talk about values, it takes it really to another level. I mean, think about uh, pro-abortion, uh, free choice, uh, pro-life, uh, re religious rights, uh, freedom of, of speech. I mean, these are values that we hold so dear. I mean, when we talk about values, are, are not those differences insurmountable? They, they really aren't insurmountable. It depends on what we decide is the absolute deal breaker. If you say, basically, I, I refuse to live in the same country or the same community as you because of how you feel about the tax rates, well, there's something wrong with me quite frankly. I mean, the idea that we can't maintain serious differences in, 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 in opinion without completely tearing ourselves apart, that doesn't make sense at all. Furthermore, you know, I have a, I have an, a, a job not to coerce you into something. I'm, I, I should try to persuade you into these particular ideas. Now, again, I have a lot, there are a lot of things that are important to me. A lot of things where I think that the policies we have in this country are really misguided, indeed wrong. But that doesn't mean that I can't work within the system. That doesn't mean I can't be on balance, happy to be part of the system. I, I just redouble my efforts to try to, you know, convince my friend Steve that he should be thinking about it my way while Steve is convincing me. We, and, and, and then we go out for a nice meal together. I mean, we can do that because we're civilized people, or at least we're supposed to be civilized people. It's okay for us to have big disagreements, in other words. I like the way you use the term coercion versus persuasion. Uh, they're really defined very differently. And, and so what you're really saying is that, sure, go ahead and try to persuade the other person, but don't use coercion. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and the, the key thing to keep in mind is that when somebody disagrees with you and you're in a leadership position or, or you're in, in charge in any way to get them to change their views or change their behavior or change their mind, you really only have three tools at your disposal, potentially. You have coercion, you have negotiation, and you have persuasion. Now, the enlightenment in our society, it elevated persuasion to the highest moral level. 
I mean, before that, in throughout all of human history, it was all coercion all the time. It was basically, you have more sheep than me. Well, I'm going to come get your sheep, right? And that's in you know the the rule of law, the the role of logic, the idea of science. What it did is it elevated this idea that persuasion is important, that I should be able to convince you of something potentially, and and to do so relatively peacefully. Negotiation is something where persuasion is simply not possible, but we still need to coexist. But what we should be doing is look working for persuasion more than we are because it's morally right. But there's something else, Steve, which is that people don't have as much coercive power as they think. You know, we're still going to oscillate between Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C. and who's got the power. You know, every time that there's a, a wave election, they say, well, the other party is going to be out of power for 45 years and it's always two. Right. And that's a good thing about our system as far as I'm concerned. I actually like it when people when there's when there's this competition. You know, we don't have very much coercive power. And I'm on campus and and I hear you know the cancel culture in full blast saying we need to completely vanquish these odious ideas and, and it, it makes me unsafe to hear things with which I disagree. That's that's using the language of coercion that the coercion that coercive power they really don't have. And so the result is that people are fooled into thinking that they should hate their enemy and that they'll somehow win a glorious victory. No, they won't. We should be training people in the tools, as you do, in the tools of persuasion, because that's the highest moral good. You, know, you mentioned the cancel culture, and I really was, uh, thought it was fascinating, your term, the outrage industrial complex in your, in your talk. Uh, so that is all so pervasive in society and you say, sure, uh, turn off the social media, turn off the Facebook, you know, ignore the radio and the television, but it's all around us. So, mm. you know, it's easier said than done. How do we do that? Because it's everywhere, everywhere we turn, we're, we're just facing this, this outrage industrial complex. Absolutely. And, and part of the reason is because there's this huge commercial incentive to keep us all addicted, to keep us all hooked on it. One of the, I teach a class in happiness at the Harvard Business School. And, and one of the things that I ask my students to do as, a, as an exercise is a social media fast, is to basically to, to, to get off their social media platforms. And I recommend it to every single person watching us. Social media can be used to very good purpose. But at the same time, if you're using it to the exclusion of your your actual relationships with your friends and your family, you're going to get more outrage. You're, by the way, you're also going to get unhappier and lonelier because you're going to mess up your brain chemistry by excessively using these, these social means that don't have actual human touch and eye contact. The result is that people can manipulate you. They can use you. They can use you as tools. So we absolutely can be free of these, these uh, to be free of these forces. It's easy to fall prey to them, especially as a form of kind of limbic entertainment, lizard brain entertainment. <laughs> but but let's stand up and be people. The prop this is interesting. You know, when I when I get groups of people together, when I'm studying the idea of political reconciliation, and I'll get really strong conservatives and really strong liberals together in the same room. You know what I do, Steve? No devices, number one. And number two, I make them talk to each other at the beginning of the conversation about their kids. Why? Because they're talking about their shared loves. No device is driving people apart and talking about their shared loves. And they are friends from then on out because the friendship, the relationship, the brotherhood and sisterhood, the love is more important to all of us than the conflict. The conflict takes center stage when we use the means, including social media, including cable TV, including substituting the national for the local, all of these insidious trends in our society until we start acting in a way that, that we wouldn't be proud of and, and, and our mothers wouldn't be proud of if they saw us doing this. You know, the idea of, of finding commonality between individuals with differing beliefs at the National Conflict Resolution Center, we use that technique in mediation. We oftentimes with people who are adversaries, they come into the mediation and we try to find at first step, uh, where is the, the commonality? Uh, but you, you talk about having a, a Democrat, Republican in the room together. Uh, but we don't often find that in our society. You know, you're, you're a professor on, on the college campus. We do a lot of work in higher education. We're uh, teaching uh, students, student leaders, how to be more inclusive, how to talk to people who look different than themselves. Because what we're finding is that many of the student leaders are, are in a club. 
Uh, they might be in a fraternity, sorority. You know, sometimes right. there's four or 500 clubs on a campus, and each student just stays in that club, and they remain in that silo. And so what we found in our training, the Art of Inclusive Communication, is the critical point of bringing people together to have respectful dialogue. But I think that same, really that same phenomenon is happening in society where people remain in their own silos. So how do we create more inclusive environments where people who do have differing perspectives can actually communicate with each other? Well, you're right. The filter bubble problem is what we call it in social science is, you know, people create these filter bubbles either online or in person. And, and our society has become increasingly segregated is what we see. So economically segregated for sure. I mean, if you're from an upper middle class or, or you know, upper class neighborhood, likely your kids have never met anybody who suffers from poverty, for example. Um, we are really, I mean, it's, it's just extraordinary the extent to which we are we're segregated by race, by religion, by, and especially by ideological views. I mean, you can go in a small town in Oklahoma and never meet a Democrat. You can walk up and down the streets in Manhattan and never meet a Republican. Uh, and, you know, the right. same thing is true on college campuses. And the big problem on college campuses today is that it, 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 it feeds on itself. And so people, you know, it's true that there's sort of one major way of thinking and then people who think differently feel uncomfortable and they feel like they're driven out. And the cancel culture on top of that is trying to drive them out. Well, that's hugely insidious. It's really damaging for the way that we, we try to have a better culture. And the way to, to, the way to combat that to begin with is once again, everybody watching us were leaders and people in leadership positions all over the country modeling it. So I, you know, I spoke to the incoming members of Congress, half Republican, half Democrat. And the advice that I gave them, I say, this is the new day because nobody coming into Congress right now is like, I love this polarization. They all hate it now, right? So I say, since you hate it now, do something about it. And the way to do it is by showing inclusivity, respect, civility, love to people on the other side of the aisle. Don't agree, but model how to disagree with love. When you divide that, this is what couples try to do in front of their kids all the time. Mom and dad disagree on something. It's great to disagree in front of the kids. Just don't be a jerk about it. Don't be contemptuous about it. Show love as you disagree and good humor. Well, this is what our leaders need to do. This is what our university leaders need to do and our politicians need to do. This is the advice that I'm giving to leaders and the advice I think that I'd like to give to everybody watching us here tonight. Go find somebody with whom you disagree. Make close friends and in public, Talk about how you mediate your disagreements in an, in an agreeable, respectful, even loving way. That will have a big impact. Okay, Arthur. So, so it's critical to be to agreeably disagree. Uh, uh, let's disagree with one another. And let's say I engage with another individual uh, who has a different perspective. I'm respectful in the way I present my point. But mm. what if the other person doesn't respond in kind? Uh, what do we yeah. do in that situation? How do you stay the course when I'm acting appropriately, but the other person is just outrageous? Well, all you can do is to, is to model the right behavior on your own behalf. You can't control the behavior of another person. You will have a much, much higher likelihood of affecting their behavior through your good behavior. And I'll give you an example. I mean, when the Dalai Lama, when he said to me, show warm heartedness, he said, think of a time when you did and how it made you feel. And, and I remember this time when I had a book that came out, it was a long time ago, it was more than 10 years ago now. And it was a controversial book by accident, just through circumstance. And it, it, it kind of got in the headlines a little bit because the president of the United States was reading it. It was a weird thing. It happens where a, a university professor has like a flash of lightning and, 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 and people started lighting up my email that who would read my book. And when somebody reads your book and they, they don't know you, but they like it, they tell you, and if they hate it, they hate you and they tell you that too. So I got this email from a guy, and I remember it very distinctly, a guy in Texas. He said, Dear Professor Brooks, you're a fraud. And he went through my entire book. It was like a 5,000 word email about everything that was wrong with the book, every data set, every conclusion, everything. It was like, but in vitriolic detail, you know, the, the columns in table 3.1 are reversed, you moron, stuff like that, right? And, and I was very defensive and very threatened by it as I was reading it, but I also realized that I was feeling weirdly gratitude because you know he read my book you know yeah. i mean it's like and nobody reads my books so at the, especially at the time they were boring man and so I, I wrote back to him i had nothing to lose and i said you're so and so i know you hate my book and you hate me and everything's terrible this is all clear 
But I just want to tell you, it took me two years to write that book and I put my whole heart into it. And you clearly read every word. And I'm really grateful to you. Thank you. Send. And I felt so, I felt so good because I didn't actually exhibit the behavior of contempt that he had exhibited. And here's the weird thing, Steve. 15 minutes later, his email pops back up and he says, Dear Professor Brooks, next time you're in Dallas, if you want to get some dinner, give me a call. It, it was an expression of friendship that turned his contempt into kindness toward me. He didn't think I was, he thought I was going to either not react and not read it, in which case I don't know why he wrote 5,000 words, or he thought that I was going to react with the same kind of contemptuous and sort of big battle with them. And I just, I acted the right way. There's no downside to being the person your mother wants you to be, basically. There's just no downside to it. You feel better about yourself and you have a fighting chance of changing the other person. And you'll never say to yourself, you know what? You know what I really regret on your deathbed? I regret not being more of a jerk. Nobody has ever said that, right? So be the person that you wanna be and you will be always rewarded on your own terms and sometimes rewarded in the reaction that you get. So. I I mean, you're doing a great job uh, persuading me not to pursue contempt. But mm -hmm. I have just one final question. I, I really have about 10 more questions, but we're, we're really almost out of time. So, you know, I was watching the storming of the Capitol. Don't those individuals deserve contempt? How do we, how do we move forward when, when you see individuals like that? So to say that somebody deserves contempt is different than saying that their actions require condemnation. You know, separating people from their words and from their actions is something that we should be able to do. It's what a sophisticated person is able to do. But again, the outrage industrial complex, what are they encouraging us to do? To, 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 to take people and not separate the people from their words, to not separate people from their views. Or, or even from their actions. If I don't like something that Steve says, Steve's a jerk, Steve's a bad guy. Now let's think about where we are. We've had the last six months have been brutal with respect to civil unrest. And here's the thing that you find from people that are on the, in, on the fringes in politics today. What do they say? Doesn't matter where you are, right or left. They say, your rioters are thugs and criminals. My rioters at worst are misunderstood. What is that? That's selective outrage. That's all because people are, are inextricably tied to their actions. And I like those people, I excuse their actions if they're on my side. And if I don't like the actions and the people on the other side, therefore I don't like those people and I treat them with contempt. Both of those things are, an in, are logically inconsistent and they're a mistake. No person is worthy of contempt. Lots of actions are worthy of condemnation. And, 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 and we should condemn what happened at the Capitol and we should punish those things. But at the same time, let's remember that nobody is beyond redemption. Nobody is somebody that we should hate and dismiss. That's the wrong thing to do. It's impractical and I think it's immoral and ultimately, it leads all of us toward a society that none of us can win and none of us is going to like. Arthur Brooks, you have led us on a path forward. I, I really have enjoyed the conversation tonight. I look forward to our next conversation. And uh, thank you so much for your, your input and all of your guidance. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the work that the center is doing. Uh, thanks to all the supporters for making it possible. Uh, you know, just on behalf of me and my fellow citizens, uh, NCRC is making the world a better place. So thanks to everybody for that, especially to you, Steve. Well, thank you and good night. So what now? If you're feeling anything like I am, you are inspired and wondering what to do next. As we've heard from Arthur and Steve, it is going to take all of us to step forward and engage in successful conversations with people who don't necessarily think like us in order to move towards reuniting this country. Now, you may be thinking, easier said than done. Well, not necessarily. We have actually created opportunities for you to engage in these conversations in a safe and respectful environment. And we encourage you to take advantage of these occasions. Join the National Conflict Resolution Center in The Art of Inclusive Communication, meeting each other along the political spectrum. 
this interactive, skill-building workshop to practice talking to people about political differences will prepare you for having conversations in your own community. You will leave with improved communication skills and proven techniques to better manage conflict. We will also be facilitating group conversations around topics like from contempt to collaboration and the power and peril of loving your enemies. These are all free to join. You just have to register. And finally, if you're thinking that your workplace would benefit from some of the principles we've talked about today, applied in a practical and professionally focused way, please be sure to download our communication toolkit for the workplace. In one simple document, you will learn multiple strategies for a successful, high-performance workplace. The toolkit is free to download and available as a resource for you. Unity will not happen unless we, the citizens, take action. Yes, it will be wonderful if we can see our nation's leaders exemplify this. But if we don't participate on an individual level, we cannot truly bring our country back together. We must relearn how to have conversations with people we disagree with. Otherwise, we will end up right back in the middle of a divisive and potentially violent election cycle in two and four years. This is our chance to do what we have all said we hope for, create a more unified country seeking common ground to move issues forward. And remember, the National Conflict Resolution Center is always here to help if you'd like to engage in these workshops or conversations to get started down this road. Back to you, Steve. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Arthur, for being with us this evening and sharing such thoughtful insight. Most of all, thanks to all of you who tuned in tonight. You are the peace ambassadors who will help us truly create a path forward. Stay tuned for our other exciting events in 2021, including our annual gala, the Peacemaker Awards, where I am proud to announce we are honoring Dr. Anthony Fauci as our 2021 National Peacemaker. We will also be holding another A Path Forward discussion in July, and on September 11th, 2021, we'll have a special event in partnership with the Mainly Mozart Festival to mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Please stay tuned for more details.